Welcome to the Individual Matters podcast and video series, where we're focused on learning about learning. My name is Andrew Caton. I'm your host and director of Individual Matters, a psychology practice specializing in evaluations. I'm joined by my co-host and wife, Dr. Katrina Caton, a licensed psychologist and also an educator and author. Today, we continue our series focused on executive functioning. In our first segment, we gave an overview of how executive functioning affects learning and life in general. Next, we introduced our five R solutions for everyday living and talked about the importance of the first R, reframing and redefining. In this segment, we'll explain the second R, which stands for reduce, reduce, reduce. So what does it mean to reduce, reduce, reduce? Why is that important for executive functioning? Um, and, and, and why are we talking about that today? Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm so excited to talk about reduce, reduce, reduce. Just the thought of reducing things in life brings a sense of calm and peace and confidence in managing the day, I feel like. Um, so the other thing that's really great about it is the reduce, reduce, reduce targets all six of the clusters that we talked about and the sub skills. So what I want to do is uh, give five strategies today that you can take home and try this week, maybe pick one or two, give it a try, see how it goes. Um, so we're going to give those five strategies and then I want to talk about which of the executive functions it targets and why. So we're all pretty overloaded in things in life and in school, and especially over the last year, things have gotten busier and busier. So as I understand it, this reduce, reduce, reduce strategies is really focused on, uh, I say focus, it's, re it's focused on reducing to a single point of focus, right? That's kind of the, the thing to keep in mind here. That's right. So anytime you're thinking, how can I help my child? How can I help myself? What is going on? Why are we overwhelmed? Why aren't we getting things done? This one is a quick one that comes up. Okay, what can I reduce? How can I take what's going on and reduce it down to a single point of focus? Okay, and so what's this first strategy that we can use? Okay, so the first strategy uh, is a timer. So we've all talked about timers probably in the past with how long something goes or until it's time to leave. But today we're talking about a timer, meaning I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna focus on this one task and I'm gonna give myself 20 minutes. Um, and, the, and the amount of time may be different depending on age. So um, if you've gotta sit down and work on that long-term project, then you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna get out my egg timer or my phone with the timer on it if that's not a distraction. And I'm going to work on this project for 20 minutes. When the timer goes off, I'm gonna close that project and move on to the next thing. So you can use that to regulate your time, essentially. Regulate your time, your effort, and your focus um, so that you have a, a set start and end point and you're working through it and you're not so worried about watching your watch or, 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 or keeping track of other things that you need to do. That's all you're doing during that time, right? Yeah, so let me just run through the six clusters and kind of give you a good idea of why this timer works so well. So first of all is activation getting started. So I have this huge project, or I've got all this homework, where do I start? I'm overwhelmed, I don't feel like it. Um, this allows me to pick one thing and just get started. And wherever I am at the end of that 20 minutes, I can look at the next thing. So it sort of creates an activation. What am I gonna do first? I get out my egg timer, this is what I'm gonna do. Um, it also helps with prioritizing. Sometimes it's hard to prioritize when everything feels important. How do you choose when it all matters? And this gives you that sense of, okay, I'm gonna work on this for 20 minutes, then I'll move on to the next one for 20 minutes, and then the next one for 20 minutes. So everything gets to be a priority and you don't have to choose one, two, three. It also helps with focus. So when we have trouble sustaining our attention, we know I can sustain this for 20 minutes. Nothing else is coming in during this time, regardless of what the um, need is. I'm doing this for 20 minutes. When I'm done, I can attend to whatever else might be going on. It also doesn't require any shifting of attention. So it's a single point of attention and focus. Um, it can help with effort. So um, for the students who are like, oh, how many more is there? I can't do all these. Do I have to do all these? When am I done? When can I go outside and play? So with this, it gives them that sense of, okay, I've got 20 minutes and then I'm out of here. I can go play or I can get snack or whatever it might be. So it really helps those who have mental fatigue sustain that effort. Um, emotional regulation, it also helps kind of 
fight some of those battles of I don't want to, I'm frustrated. It kind of lays out the roadmap so there's not those arguments and fights. Um, memory, and that's including juggling. So this really cuts down on how much do I have to mentally juggle at one point. Again, we're like single point of focus. And then action for that self-monitoring. How long have I been working on this? How much am I going to do? I don't have to worry about it. I go until the timer dings. I'm done. I close it up and I move on to the next thing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Timers are great for so many things, um, for doing homework and projects. I even think about it in some of the other things that we do in life activities as adults. I won't get into that, but whether you're doing chores or remembering to do the laundry or even if you're doing a workout, right? A lot of us do timed workouts um, as a way of, of kind of pacing ourselves through and, and, and keeping in mind, look, I might not want to be doing this at this at, at the moment, but um, I know that I only have 20 minutes and then I'll and then I'll be done. And I want to say the key is to figure out what's the right amount of time. So 20 minutes might be good for some people. That might be too long for some younger kids. It might not be long enough for some older um, students with bigger projects. So play along, play around with it and see kind of what fits. Um, so it's some trial and error there. But you'll find, you'll find your mark and you'll know it. Cool. All right. What is the second strategy? Okay. Number two is uh, reducing clutter. And when I say clutter, I'm talking about visual clutter, I'm talking about noise clutter, I'm talking about bags, desks, workspace, locker, rooms, all of those things. So anytime you feel like the child or yourself is feeling overwhelmed, then start looking around, where's the clutter? Um, a lot of times people with executive function, really the issue is that their mind is full of clutter and it's not real organized. So you wanna be able to organize the environment to help organize the mind. It also serves as an interesting um, point that for people with executive function or even ADHD or other things, when things get overwhelmed, their environments tend to become more and more cluttered. So if you notice that the notebook is cluttered, the folders are cluttered, the bag is, is cluttered, the room is cluttered, then that's a pretty good indication that the student's feeling pretty overwhelmed and that's a good time to go back and kind of declutter those things. What's essential? What's a single point of focus? Yeah, and the environment really affects, like you said, it really affects our mind too, especially if you're, you know, if you're an organized or disorganized person or if you're a visual learner and you find things in your room or find things on your schedule or kind of prioritize what you're going to be doing next, if you can't see it because it's buried in clutter, whether it's stuff on your floor or stuff on your desk or a messy binder or a messy backpack, it's you don't have those visual cues to, to remind you that things need to get done too, right? Mm -hmm. And I think when there's a lot of visual clutter, it's easy to get distracted. So for those who can't focus, it's easy to, oh, what's this? Or, um, oh, I forgot, I need to do that. Um, and I think it also ties into emotion and feeling overwhelmed and stressed. So we all can think about those times where we've been in a really nice space that's organized, it's not overly cluttered, and it just feels relaxing. Um, it's not always easy to get there when you have executive function problems, but we all know that once we're there, oh, it feels so good. So it really targets all of those as well. Okay, so use a timer, declutter, and then what is the third strategy? So the third strategy is really geared towards um, parents and teachers when um, you're working with a student who's struggling with executive function or getting their work turned in or getting it done is really to tighten up the message. Um, what this means is reduce the amount of words coming out of your own mouth to that single point of focus. You want to be careful not to launch into lectures or to overload with too many steps, too many things that need to get done, but really reduce your own message to that single point of focus. And one way to do this is to focus on action and object. What is the action and the object that you want done? So for example, you're getting ready in the morning and you want them, you know, for a younger child to grab your shoes. So the single point of focus is grab your shoes and avoid things like, please go get your shoes and put them on. We should have had these by the door last night. Let's go, those kinds of things. Shoes, please grab them. Action and object. Okay, great. Timer, declutter, tighten up the message. Uh, let's move on to number four, what's that? So this is probably my favorite and it's give the big picture first. So this is the punchline. This is the reason that you're talking. This is the reason that you're working on something. So what is the big picture? 
So for a lot of students who are more right-brained or have executive function issues is that their mind tends to work in reverse. So they need the big picture first. They need to know what are we doing so that I know where to put those details. So rather than from A to B to C and then we arrive, you need to start where you would arrive and then go back to A, B, and C. Give the big picture first. That's a that's a really important message. That doesn't just apply to, to uh, executive functioning either, does it? That's teaching in the classroom. That's marketing. That's that's lots of things, right? Yeah, and certainly even, um, you know, we, we joke at home because I'll come home with a funny story and want to share it with Andrew and I'll say, oh, my gosh, listen to what happened and this and this and this and this and this and this and then I'll deliver the punchline or – and he'll say, oh, that's so funny. What happened? <laughs> and then I have to go back and start. Um, whereas if I kind of start with the punchline, even though it feels like I'm ruining it, um, then I get his full attention because that way he knows what is the point of all these details. It helps him prioritize what I'm saying, helps him sustain his effort, um, and helps kind of juggle all those details I might be adding in. So. Yeah, I always think of it like a like a jigsaw puzzle. If you start handing pieces to somebody, where do you put those pieces? You know, without knowing what the picture is supposed to look like, you don't have any context. So they're just floating around out there. Um, so knowing where we're going with this thing helps me think, okay, here's what I need to do next, and here's why this matters and so forth. Yeah, the other example I like is um, if you're – in a parking lot and you're saying, okay, I want you to um, turn out of the parking lot, I want you to go left, then take your first right, and then when you get to the stop sign, go right again, and then take your left at the next light. And it's like, whoa, okay, where are we going? Whereas if I were to say, hey, we're going to head downtown to the post office, and you have a good idea of where the post office is, then your mind can organize all those left and rights and be able to hold on to that information longer and to juggle it so that um, you can make it to where the destination is. So if you give that destination first, um, much more likely to sustain focus, hold on to the details. Um, and this is really critical in the classroom um, for kids to know where are we going with this. Um, so as a teacher, if you can put that out first, you're going to get a lot more attention and um, working memory strategies used by the kids to stay with you um, and I also think this is important when a child is maybe in trouble and you've got to deliver some consequences or, you know, hit to the punchline first, because if their stress is building, trying to figure out what you're getting at, they're not going to hear anything until you deliver that punchline. That's some really good information. Okay. So we have timer, declutter, tighten up the message, give the big picture first. What's our last strategy for today? So the last strategy that really helps with a single point of focus is setting goals and determining what is it that you're gonna work on. And specifically, I love SMART goals. I think um, they're so great for um, setting large goals and for setting small goals. But what I really love um, in session working with families and individuals is when we set a SMART goal, depending on which aspect of that SMART goal they struggle the most with, tells me which one of the executive functions is most difficult for them, and then I'm really able to target it. So for some people, it's a measurable goal. They say something like, well, my goal is to be happy. Well, that's not necessarily measurable, so it's gonna be hard to know when you get there. For others, they might not be able to um, break it down. And so then their SMART goal is huge, like write a thesis. Okay, well, that's pretty big. I think we need to break it down. Um, for others, it's really about time management. And so they set a goal of, well, I want my um, Eagle Scout project done by July 15th. It's June 1st. Make a timeline, make a SMART goal, find out, whoa, that's not actually reasonable. So is it a reasonable timeline? And for that individual, I might realize, oh, so time management's the problem, realizing how long things might take. So um, there's lots of information out about SMART goals, and I think we'll probably do a specific um, segment on SMART goals and how you can set them and how you can figure out where the hurdles are there. But um, I think setting the goal and using something like a SMART goal can really help you prioritize, organize, focus that attention, self-monitor, all those executive functions that we talk about with those clusters. For sure. Yeah, you just can't understate the value of using SMART goals. They're, they're so great, not only for adults, where we think of them maybe in business, but for students, for kids. And as you said, they help us actually 
understand our own executive functioning deficits a little bit better so that we can hone in on those. Okay, today we have talked about the second R of the series, reduce, reduce, reduce. The whole key message here has been to reduce focus to a single point. That's really been the goal here. Is there anything else that you want to add before we sign off? No, I would just say pick one or two of those five strategies and try it for the over the next week or so, see how it works, then try on the other ones. And again, don't do all five of them at once um, because the whole point is to reduce, not to um, overload yourself. So um, try those out and um, we'd love to hear back about how those go for you. Great. That's it from us today. We hope you'll join us at our next segment where we focus on rhythm and routines, where we're going to continue to take a positive and solution-focused look at potential EF problems and strategies for skill building.